My name is Lacey Williams Henschel, and I'm a consultant with RevSys. We're a Django consultancy. We do Django REST framework, React, Docker, Wagtail, all kinds of stuff. So if you have questions about that, definitely see me after. I'm also one of the organizers of DjangoCon US, which starts in San Diego in eight days. Um, we are a community sponsor of PyGotham. PyGotham is a community sponsor for us. And we're just really happy to be part of a Python conference community that's so willing to share ideas and be generous with one another. So thank you so much to PyGotham. So this talk came from the fact that I have not one but two English degrees. And I get asked a lot how it feels to not be using my degree every day. And I really hate that question because I feel like as an English major, what I did was read things and then write about them. And what I do as a programmer is read things and write about them. So I use my English degree every day. And I think that Jane Austen would agree with me. All of us here are using reading and writing skills on a daily basis in our jobs. And whenever I say that, I mean code. Obviously, we read and write code. It's important that we understand what we're reading and that it be readable. Whenever we're adding a new feature, we need to contextualize that feature, figure out where it should go in the code base, where that's appropriate. But we also read documentation to learn about the libraries that we're using. We read tutorials, like the Django Girls tutorials, whenever we need step-by-step -step instructions on how to do something new. We might read or write blog posts to share tips that maybe don't belong in documentation or maybe don't warrant a full tutorial, but we still want to share our knowledge and get that knowledge from others. We ask questions on Stack Overflow. And asking questions on Stack Overflow is its own set of skills, right? You have to outline your problem. You have to provide a code snippet. And then you have to say where it is that you're getting stuck. And then answering a question on Stack Overflow is also its own challenge. You need to be respectful. You need to explain your, your solution clearly. Make sure that it's applicable to this particular user and is answering the question that they asked and not the question that maybe you think that they're asking. Um, and, but also, hopefully, you're writing the answer in such a way that other people that maybe have a similar problem, but not this identical problem, can still learn from what you've written. And then finally, pull requests. Most libraries that I know of don't want you to just submit a pull request with just your code and no other explanation. They want you to type something. They want to know what issue you're addressing. They want to know how you arrived at the solution, um, some, you know, some information about how you got here. And then they also might have some suggestions for you. Maybe you should add documentation or tests. Maybe they would prefer that you approach this problem in a different way. But there's a conversation that happens whenever you submit a pull request. So all of this is about communication, ultimately. So whenever I was conceiving this talk, I was thinking about Pride and Prejudice, because that is Jane Austen's most famous and recognizable work. And I was thinking, what part of Pride and Prejudice would be the most fun for Jane Austen to code instead of write about? And my favorite scene is the scene whenever Elizabeth Bennet has arrived at Caroline Bingley's and Charles Bingley's house to visit her sister who is sick. And she and Caroline Bingley, Charles Bingley, and Fitzwilliam Darcy get into a conversation about what makes a woman accomplished. So Charles Bingley says that women who are accomplished paint tables, cover screens, and net purses. Caroline Bingley says that a woman must have a thorough knowledge of music, singing, drawing, dancing, and the modern languages. She also must possess a certain something in her air and her manner of walking and the tone of her voice, her address, and expressions. And these are all quite fuzzy requirements here. And then Mr. Darcy chimes in that she must be committed to the improvement of her mind by extensive reading. So now we know if we're going to code something that decides whether a particular person is accomplished and I'm going to say that it's the 21st century and not the 19th century. So we're going to say any person, not just a woman, can be accomplished. Um, they are accomplished if they have skills in music, languages, some miscellaneous other skills, and then some kind of non-specific person skills like something in their air. I like to think we all have something in our air, though. So the first thing I want to talk about is planning. Most of us, whenever we sit down to write anything at all, and a novel or a piece of code, we don't just sit down and start typing. We do a little bit of pre-planning. And the process for writing a novel and preparing a, a larger code project are actually really similar. On the left, you have JK Rowling's outline, chapter by chapter, of Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. And you can see on the left, there are some chapters. And then um, on the, across the top are different parts of the plot 
and so where we are with that piece of the plot at each chapter. You see there are some arrows that are connecting some things. And then on the right, there's a slide from a talk that Andrew Godwin gave at PyCon earlier this year, where he's describing a computer process, also with a lot of boxes and a lot of arrows connecting those things. So this is one way that you can organize your ideas in kind of some sort of a, a flow chart um, before you start writing. And I think that outlines, too, are a wonderful visual representation of how outlining and code go together. So on the left, we have the SpacePug outline. SpacePug is the, or it used to be, I don't know if it still is, the PyCon um, sample outline that they want you to submit whenever you are submitting a talk to them. And on the right, we have a snippet of code from the Django code base. And so you can see that this, this semantic white space that Python has really visually looks a lot like a regular outline that you would use for a talk or for a paper that you wrote in high school school or college, whenever things are nested like that, whenever we have that indentation, it prompts us to group those ideas together. So that's another part of organizing your thoughts. And Tim Peters, who wrote the Zen of Python, agrees with me here. He says, namespaces are one honking great idea. And by that, he means that you should organize your code. You shouldn't stick everything that you have into one module that becomes thousands and thousands of lines long. You could make new modules and treat them like chapters. So if we create a to-do list for what we need to do for our program to figure out who is accomplished and who is not, we need to have a person. That person needs to be able to have skills. We need to be able to decide if they're skilled in particular areas, and then decide based on the skill level in those areas whether they are accomplished as just a yes or no question overall. So we want to do that by writing chapters and not big ethics. If whenever we plan our code, we jump right in and start writing, we might end up with this kind of long-winded mess that would be difficult to understand, difficult for someone else to maintain, very difficult to test. So if we just jumped in and started writing out everything that we had, we might end up with a class that looks like this, where we have a person, and then we let that person have skills individually, yes or no. And this means every time we become aware of a new skill, maybe we paint fewer tables, and now we write more programs, um, we have to add that particular skill, and that becomes pretty unwieldy pretty quickly. And to decide if someone is accomplished, we could say they have to have all of the skills, but probably there's not anyone who has truly all of the skills that it takes, and we might want people to be accomplished if they don't have literally every skill that we've thought of. And if we do this this way, then we might have this, this incredible mess of nested if statements that is very unwieldy and difficult for us to test. So Strunk and White in the Elements of Style, which a lot of us read in high school or college or at least had to read part of, they say when a sentence is made stronger, it usually becomes shorter. So if we instead plan what we need and think through our requirements, we can code what we need to in smaller chunks and build in some flexibility and make our code easier to maintain. So instead of having this one giant person model that lists literally all of the skills we can think of, we can have a separate skill model that goes ahead and categorizes our skills for us. Then we can have a person model that connects to those skills. So one person can have many skills. We can add these skills individually, edit them individually, and it's a little bit easier to understand. And then we can decide separately if someone is accomplished based on the result of these other methods that we can write later on. So if they're musically skilled, linguistically skilled, and otherwise skilled, then they get to be accomplished. We also have this thing about there's something in their air. We're just going to have that return true because everyone has unique qualities. So now we come to concrete tips about writing well. This is going to be the spelling, the grammar, the syntax, but also the words that you use. Word choice is really important. Naming things very well, having descriptive variable names that mean something, having clear doc strings, which Kojo talked about yesterday in his talk, um, will really help your code communicate your points well. Whenever you're writing, remember that you're having a conversation with the people that are coming into your code after you. And again, I refer to the Zen of Python. And this is not in order. These are selections from the Zen of Python. But he says, simple is better than complex, sparse is better than dense, and readability counts. And I think a lot of us have had that experience where maybe we've searched for a problem on the internet and gone down a rabbit hole because maybe the docs weren't very helpful, they were confusing, or maybe the feature that we had questions about had never been documented. And then we get to Stack Overflow, but the Stack Overflow question and answer that we see doesn't really address our problem or is very tailored to something else or is also kind of confusingly explained. And maybe we wind up in the code itself, 
but the code is kind of unwieldy wieldy and difficult to, to understand. And we get really frustrated. It's frustrating to have a question and not be able to answer it because the resources that we have aren't clear. This is why writing well in your code, but also in your documentation, in the answers that you give to other people online, is really important. And Jane Austen said in a letter to her, I believe her niece who was writing, that your descriptions are often more minute than will be liked. This reminds me of Charles Dickens. That man was paid by the word, and he really used that to his benefit financially. Um, but yeah, communicating well means getting to your point and making it clearly. Your functions and your methods should do one thing and do that one thing very, very well. This makes it easier to change things later on. It makes it easier to change your mind and change the requirements and add new features later on. So if we return to this is accomplished property, we know that we will have these four methods that we'll need to write. And this method is, at this point, pretty easy to understand. We're just returning the result of you know, the truth of all of these methods. If we dive down into one of them, the is musically accomplished, then we realize that what that's doing is just returning whether the number of skills a person has that are musical is greater than three. Now, this isn't perfect. We're using the magic number three. We should probably make that a constant. We also don't have a doc string at this point. But as is, it's still pretty easy to understand, even though there's some room for improvement. Then we can drill down even further, and we can realize that getting the number of musical accomplishments is just returning a, a particular count from a query set. So this is all really easy to test. This is really easy to maintain, and it's, it's pretty easy to understand as well. The second to last point that I want to make is about plot. So a plot generally is going to look like this. Um, exposition is whenever you're laying out your characters, your scene, what's happening, all of the context for where you are. The rising action is whenever tension is building, where we've created some sort of a problem that we need to solve, and we haven't yet gotten to the solution. The climax is whenever something really, really important has happened, something that is going to change things or give us some information that we'll have to deal with. The falling action is whenever we deal with the consequences of this particular climax. And then the denouement is the happy ending. So to return to Pride and Prejudice, the exposition is whenever we meet Mr. and Mrs. Bennett and their daughters, Jane, Elizabeth, Mary, Kitty, and Lydia. We also meet Mr. Charles Bingley and Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy. And we meet Mr. Wickham, who is represented by the trash can. <laughs> In the rising action, we go to a ball. Mr. Bingley and Jane meet and start to fall in love. Um, Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy meet and decidedly do not start to fall in love. And then there is a misunderstanding, and Mr. Darcy winds up taking Mr. Bingley away to London so that he will be away from Jane. In the climax, Mr. Darcy realizes that he has been wrong about Elizabeth. He is madly in love with her, and he proposes. But she says no, because he's been a real jerk up to this point. Meanwhile, Lydia runs away with the trash can Mr. Wickham. In the falling action, Mr. Darcy saves the day. He deals with the Wickham catastrophe. He fixes the trash can. And then Jane and Charles Bingley get engaged and will live happily ever after. And in the denouement, Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth get married, and they will also live happily ever after. So if we apply this understanding of plot to the code that we've already written, we can see that we have some exposition here. Our exposition is that we have a person, and that that person has some skills. Our rising action is knowing that we have a question about this person, whether they are accomplished in a particular area. Do they sing, dance, and also play the pianoforte? The climax is whenever we return the truth about this. Is this person sufficiently musical as to be called accomplished? The falling action takes place outside of that method. The falling action is whenever we're dealing with the result of that method. So what happens in this is accomplished property whenever we are folding in the result of whether someone is musically accomplished into the overall holistic understanding of their accomplished status. And then the denouement is whenever we figure out, is this person overall accomplished? Mr. Wickham obviously is not. Elizabeth Bennett obviously is very accomplished. Chapter five is about character development, and this is my final chapter here. So everything that we write, as I've said before, involves at least two people. There's a reader and there's also a writer. 
Even the text that's produced by a bot, like if you've written a Twitter bot or something, involved two people. There was a person who wrote the bot who influenced what the bot was going to produce. Code that's executed by machines is still produced and needs to be read and understood and edited by human beings. And I've kind of raced through this because I talk a little bit fast whenever I'm nervous, but I want to leave you with this quote from Jane Austen herself. It's only a program, or in short, only some work in which the greatest powers of the mind are displayed in the best chosen language, Python. <laughs> You can find the full code from this presentation online at willyln slash Jane Austen. Here's my information if you'd like to um, reach out to me. And um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Sorry I spoke so fast. <laughs> I'm not sure if there are any, but yeah. A microphone. Are you familiar with the project called Skynet that trained um, AI on knitting patterns and then wrote knitting patterns and then a community of knitters took those, we'll call them quote unquote knitting patterns, knitted them and compared what they got from their efforts? No, but I would love to talk with you about that. That sounds really fascinating. It's amazing. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I love this idea of coding being like writing. So I'm curious if you've given any thought to uh, um, computer science education in this context, because I feel like a lot of intro to coding things are about like making games or drawing pictures. And I'm curious about your thoughts on how you might convince like an English major undergraduate to um, take a stab at programming. Yeah, so there's a field in um, not just literature, but the humanities in general called digital humanities. I kind of feel like the future of programming isn't more people becoming programmers, it's more people who are using programming in the jobs that they already have to do those jobs in a different way, to get different data. So digital humanities is all about applying um, programming concepts to enable us to understand literature or history or manuscripts in a different way. There's this effort called TEI, which is an XML um, that is specifically for manuscripts. So it has markups for like the publisher and the author, but also for things like if an author crossed something out and then wrote on top of it, there are specific markings that you can use for that. Um, which is a really interesting way to approach like digitizing a manuscript. You can kind of analyze that manuscript in different ways. So I think that one of the, the ways to get more humanities people into coding isn't to try to convince them to change fields necessarily, but to apply these skills to the work that they already do. I have a friend who um, is a registered dietitian, and she wound up learning R whenever she was in graduate school so that she could do some data science stuff with some, some data that she had re um, related to a, a a project that she was working on. So there are a lot of applications in other fields where programming can come into play, and that doesn't necessarily mean that people have to have the title programmer or engineer in their, in their title. All right, thank you so much. <laughs>